right, video three, time to get after it. Uh, remember, in our second video, we focused on energy and the uh, concepts of where and how energy was um, generated to meet the requirement of all living things having to obtain and use energy. And we looked at, again, quickly as to review uh, two major classifications of that, our autotrophs, uh, remember individuals that were able to make their own food um, and by turning sun's energy into stored food and then the other option would be our consumers or our heterotrophs remember our disgusting shark eating the seal oh so sad um, and one thing that is very important to note remember as we had mentioned in the last video to emphasize is that these plants when they are autotrophic are making their own food but remember they do still need to break down that food and that's where the cellular respiration comes in but as long as you have a way of obtaining energy, the concept uh, is that that energy really cannot be created nor destroyed. It just gets passed around. And that's what we want to look at today, um, where and how directly that energy is passed around. Because if we zoom in and focus more on heterotrophs or the consumers, remember these two names meaning the same thing really, uh, there are in fact a lot of different um, types of consumers and different levels. Um, for example, uh, some classifications here, herbivores. Uh, from here on out, anytime we see the, the suffix vor, that's referring to eating. Uh, herb, obviously referring to plants and plant-like material. Um, these are organisms that are only eating. They Remember, they're consumers, but they're only eating autotrophs or, or, and or plants, like uh, this ugly guy here. Uh, vegetarians really eating just the autotrophs now one thing that is important right here um, and or it doesn't have to be plants we can actually have uh, things like periwinkles snails crawling around on rocks in the ocean at low tide that uh, are herbivores as well but they're eating actually types of algae and bacteria um, that, that are stuck to the rocks that are autotrophic so we can say that they're plant eaters, but be careful. It's, it would be more appropriate to say that they're eating the autotrophs, but that's all they eat. They gain all of their energy that is stored in these leaves uh, by consuming them. Uh, and along that line, a carnivore, word you've probably heard of, carnage, killing, death, destruction. They're going to go the other end of the spectrum, and they only eat, quote-unquote, meat. Um, no plants. Now, I put meat in quotation marks because we've got to be careful here with this loose classification. Uh, if you're eating, we would think of meat as bloody muscle tissue, and that's okay to think of that. But um, technically, with, with this loose general classification of carnivores, if you were to eat um, just insects, many scientists would call them an insectivore, but we can clump them in with carnivores here if we choose to because they are eating uh, just animals um, and obviously this guy here fits the standard uh, definition of carnivores even ripping apart the meat there gross and disgusting and inappropriate but when is biology not gross and disgusting uh, now we start to get into some some of the weird uh, weirder classifications uh, that are variations there omni means all all everything so these guys as the name implies are eating everything both plant and animal tissue and I put this guy in here I chose uh, in particular this bear because everyone thinks bears oh they're carnivores they are but bears are really really good at uh, fitting in and finding their niche they'll eat essentially anything they love meat fish small mammals rodents etc uh, but they also will eat berries leaves in some cases <laughs> garbage uh, they're true omnivores they're an excellent example of an omnivore along with us most of us make great omnivores as well um, continuing on with that this was um, gets a little bit strange people get confused by it but it's actually very easy detritivores detritus think of as the decaying the stuff that's left over that uh, that nobody really wants the garbage um, they're consuming decaying organic material and a great example here are these vultures um, they are actually are eating meat here but they're essentially this is after the carnivores have had their had their fill had their way um, would be that also and the last one that's most often overlooked but is probably the most important decomposers these are the on the smaller end the hidden workers of the world because they're gonna break down dead material uh, they're also many many times you'll hear 
people refer to these guys as uh, not only decomposers, but they're kind of like an ecosystem's recyclers because they're actually they're breaking down and reusing the material. Any of the carbs, lipids, proteins that are left over in there, these guys can consume and break down minerals and materials and put them back into the ecosystem which we'll look at in just a bit uh, in a moment here. So um, these guys are very, very important. A lot of fungus, bacteria. Some people will consider earthworms can be classified as detritivores and or decomposers as well. Um, but these mushrooms here, they're, they do not photosynthesize. They're not autotrophs. They're actually, you can see their hyphae. They look like little roots here in the soil. Uh, they're secreting enzymes, chemical reactions, and breaking down um, rotting dead material in here. In this case, it looks like mulch and wood. Um, so these guys are very, very important. Without them, that mulch and wood and dead bodies would stay mulch and wood and dead bodies. So very important because they're putting valuable energy and nutrients back into the ecosystem. So with that idea of energy, we can actually trace the energy flow. Sorry, it gets a little cut off here at the top, but trace the energy flow through a community or an ecosystem. In other words, if we were to follow this, where does the energy go from here to here? And the best way to do that is a food web, something you're probably very familiar with. Uh, we can have simple, and its simplest form would be food chains. Just like in a chain, um, organisms' links are linked together. The caterpillar eats the flower. The frog eats the caterpillar, the snake eats the frog, etc. Um, and this is easy. This is one um, series of chains, and, and it's simple and easy to understand. The arrows representing who eats what. In this case, the caterpillar is eating the flower. Be careful. But more importantly, the arrows are showing what many people neglect here is that it's showing the energy flow. The, it's showing that energy stored here in this producer, when the caterpillar eats it, energy goes into the caterpillar. Um, and as you can see, the energy just gets passed along and passed along. So this is a standard basic uh, way to look at that. Uh, more complex would be food webs. Take all of your food chains and plop them in there together. You can see they're like a spider web. They get very, very messy. So uh, you should be able to, let's just take a second here and note that you should be able to identify uh, specific trophic levels. Like, for example, down here, our plants would be our autotrophs. Uh, another name for them, more importantly, instead of autotrophs, we can call them primary producers. Uh, because they're actually primary, they're first in line, and they are producing the first wave of energy. They're the ones that are taking from the sun and uh, converting that energy into stored biomass. And by biomass, we'll see they're made up of carbs uh, and lipids and proteins. Our next level up, if we were to go, these would be our herbivores. This herbivorous insect, or this seed-eating bird, they're eating just the seeds and berries and plants. So we can call them herbivores. Another way we could thing we could do, we could call them the primary consumers, because they're first in line. The first consumers, which is kind of interesting. And then from there, it's just a matter of steps. Spiders would then be secondary consumers. Insectivorous birds following this pathway would be third level and up to fourth level and so on and so on. Note that in addition to calling them consumers, we can also call them carnivores. We can also call them uh, omnivores as well. Um, but it's important to be able to identify trophic levels. Absolutely. Definitely. De so what we want to do now is look at a very important question. If we're going to follow that energy, is the energy shared evenly? Does it flow throughout these organisms evenly? Because um, everyone wants to share, everyone wants to level the playing field and all that other nonsense. And if we think about it and, and look at this, what we're going to see is unfortunately uh, in this ecosystem, or, or in all of them, in all the food webs, um, the answer actually is unfortunately no. It's, it is not. In other words, the energy that's here in the grass is not shared equally because we can follow that. It goes to the marmot, eventually to the hawk. The hawk is not getting all the energy that's in that grass. And we just want to look at quickly why that's the case. So what we're going to see, very, very important concept, is what's called a 10% rule. And this is big. Only about 10% of the available energy at one trophic level is fixed or stored at the next one. Now, if we look at this pyramid here, we can actually see, again, that uh, our total energy down here in the producer level, we can see 1,000 kilocalories. 
Now what we're saying is that if all these primary consumers, in this case these grasshopper looking locust things, if they were to eat and consume every last blade of grass, all that energy, they would get the thousand calories of energy, but they would only store about 10% of that, 100. In other words, that energy would be stored in their bodies as carbs, lipids, proteins, etc. Only 10% uh, of that. And that then uh, same thing with these uh, moles and shrews that are insectivores eating these guys. They would only get 10% of that energy and so on and so on. So you can see as, that as you go up trophic levels, energy decreases. Now the million dollar question for that is, well, wait a minute, <laughs> why? Why the 10% rule? Very easy if we look at this diagram. Using this caterpillar here, he's eating this leaf. Now, they have a, a number here, joules. J is just another way to joules, another way to measure energy. But what it's saying is that this caterpillar, which is pretty funky looking, were to eat that entire leaf, all the energy in that, all 200 joules. Where does that 200 joules of energy go? And we can see here, this is the big one. 33 joules, and that's a little more than 10%. 10% would only be 20, so it's about 10%. Um, 33 joules out of those 200 would go to growth, new biomass. What that means is that that would be stored in his body as new tissue. Literally, the energy would be stored in there. Well, where does the other 167 joules go? Most of it, a majority of it, cellular respiration, which at this point, after having watched that last video, we should know that cellular respiration, this just means this is his energy. He will use that stored energy. He'll lose it. Things like walking around, uh, growing and developing, although that's a lot of that's biomass, uh, walking around, mating, escaping predators, just eating, breathing, um, that uses energy. So a lot of that's lost. And if you look at it, the other 100, a large chunk of that, feces. A lot of what's in this plant goes to waste, actually cannot be stored. When you poop, I hate to tell you, you lose energy. Uh, so that's a, a very, very important aspect too. About 10 to 20% stored as biomass. The rest of it is taken in, that is used as an energy or lost. Very important. So if we take all these concepts to, to wrap up, we can actually organize all the organisms into... Um, and amounts of energy, and we, we can actually crunch some numbers and calculate. We can organize them as what look as pyramids. Each level of the pyramid, and primarily it's best to look over here, uh, to show how much energy. For example, we've actually already seen one in this video. If you were somehow able to measure and estimate the amount of energy at each trophic level, and you organize them, you could actually see, notice it's following our 10% rule here with these weird lizard looking things, uh, that we can see that most of the energy in an ecosystem is stored at the bottom level, the primary producers, because of the 10% rule. You'd never find more energy up here because, and just like in a pyramid, that you're going to need the base to be the biggest. And that's interesting. So just to, to apply that, just as a sample calculation, let's try this one here. I want you to go through and, and attempt this guy. Let's say that there are. Uh, as we stated, 5,240,000 5, calories of energy at the primary producer level. How much would be stored at the secondary level? How are we going to do that? So go ahead, pause the video, see if you can on a scrap piece of paper figure that out, and when you're ready to give your answer, unpause it and we'll see if we're right. All right, you ready? Well, how would we do it? We need to incorporate that estimated 10% rule. So all we have to do is figure out what's 10% of that, and that's very, very easy to do. 5,240,000. If we're going with our 10% rule to calculate a percentage, all we got to do is multiply by 0.10, and that will give us our answer. And a simple way to do that, actually even more so, is to, uh, when you run, crunch your numbers and run them, really all we're doing is moving our decimal point over one place. So our answer would be 524000, zero, 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 524,000 would be at the uh, primary consumer level. So that's primary consumer. We've actually got to go one more level. This is primary consumer. We want to know how many of the secondary. What's 10% of that number? Bump that decimal place over 52400. Zero, zero. 52,400 calories would end up being our answer at this point. 
So very, very easy. We do need to know how to use that, and we'll have some practice doing that later on uh, as well. So to end with really quickly, we also can look at pyramids of biomass, where you mass how heavy, how much tissue there is. We also can do pyramids.